Welcome to Sewer Mutant, the podcast that takes you way underground to discover comic books you won't find anywhere else. I'm your guide, Clintron, and this month I'm joined by Nicholas Bunch and Mechanical Pencil Girl of the Reptile House Collective. So I know I shouldn't play favorites, but I have to say that Reptile House is my current favorite comic. Every issue is jam-packed with comics and art. If you've never seen it, check out the show notes for links. The Bloodhorn Collection by Nick Bunch is a good place to start, but I'd recommend just buying the first issue or two of Reptile House Comics and seeing if it's your thing. The latest issue is a 3D special, but we'll talk about that soon enough. Before we get started, I want to thank Crudler for letting us use his music in our show. And as usual, this podcast is explicit. You have been warned. Now, on with the show. I thought maybe we could just start by the, you know, the two of you might tell me a little bit about how you first got interested in comic books as a medium. Um, do you remember what the first comics were that you read or what made you decide to start making comics? Uh, Della, you go first because you know more about comic books than I do. Not necessarily. <laughs> All right, I'll go first. Um, so for me, I first got into comics probably with manga only because that's what I had access to first. I grew up mostly down south in Virginia, so I had like Sailor Moon and, you know, whatever other bullshit comics that you can get your hands on. And then eventually, as I got older, I got really into 70s underground comics and, and uh, like erotica and all sorts of weird shit. And that's where, like, I don't know, I was already doing illustration from a young age and I didn't know much about like art in general. And I didn't know there was art out there that didn't include getting into a museum or a gallery. And I found an issue of Juxtapose magazine and then from there it just built up into all these different interests. And also Heavy Metal magazine was like my big thing. And, you know, then from there it just kind of happened right now. Awesome. Um, and then for me, when I was growing up, I had um, a cool uncle that would take me to the comic book store. And I remember buying a lot of uh, the Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure comic, the Evan Dorkin one. That's pretty cool. And also I was really into... Uh, I really like the Spawn comics, and I think there was actually like a like a Kiss, like the band Kiss had a comic. Um, wow, that one's really cheesy. Like Kiss Psycho Circus or something. I thought it was great. I loved it. <laughs> it's yeah, it was. It would definitely be like a great thing as a kid, and you look at it as an adult. And it's like, right, right, yeah. I mean, but as a um, I don't know, ten year old boy, I was. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and like chains and leather, you know. Um, and then I, I really wasn't into comics for a long time, like after like adolescence. Um, and then when I moved to Philly in 2016, I was doing a lot of film stuff um, prior to that. But when I moved here, I didn't have any friends, and I realized that you needed friends to do film stuff. But I was doing a lot of storyboarding, and then I was like, well, maybe these storyboards should just be the final thing, which is essentially comics. Yeah, I was doing like erotica illustrations and everything, and I've always loved comics, and I've always wanted to try my hand at it. I'm still pretty crappy at them, but, you know, I'm trying. I don't think so. I don't think they're crappy, but yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So were, were the two of you doing comics before Reptile House or was Reptile House like your first outing? Um, I put out a couple things, put out a comic called Drunk Doofy and The Greatest Week Ever. Forget what the second Drunk Doofy was called. So I had done two. Um, yeah, what about you, Adela? Did you had you put anything out prior to this? Not particularly. I was planning on doing more of a art book thing, and I was writing comics. I just wasn't illustrating them much until Reptile House kind of motivated me to do it. Because I would have done this other story that was like kind of too serious and not as like you know loose and fun as the stuff I put in Reptile House. Uh, in 2016 and like 2017, um, Adela and I were both part of a drawing group called Sequential Philly. And that had a lot of, oh wait, no, it was called Contour Philly. 
Contour Philly. Contour Philly. And that was <laughs> run by our friends Derek and Aremo. And that was a lot of sort of similar, like, like-minded people who were not necessarily all comic artists, but definitely all, like, illustrators and yeah. also comic artists. And I, I think we sort of just pillaged that drawing group and just stole a ton of people out of that for Reptile House. Well, I almost forgot. I don't know why I forget this, but I was doing girl crime, which was mostly illustrative type stuff and like a bunch of like delinquent artists that I've managed to grab. And then that kind of like fizzled out or I just like put it on hiatus. And then we were all meeting up at this contour Philly thing. And we never went to the other comic drawing group. We all just kind of stuck with ours and yeah. then it felt like we were just the rejects. <laughs> So yeah, I, I was going to ask like how Reptile House got started. So it sounds like it, it kind of grew out of Contour Philly. It just the uh... kind of someone had someone had asked me to be a part of an anthology, like maybe like a week or two before it was getting put out, and I was like, dude, there's no way, but I'll do your next one. Like, when's the next one going to come out? And he's like, oh yeah, well we usually do these like once a year, once every two year. And I was like, well, fuck that. Like, um, we can just put out our own as a quarterly. Um, and at that point, I think both me and Adela, and then the other person really who helped form it is Tia, um, mm -hmm. Tia Roche. Um, I think the three of us sort of had a few meetings at this local comic shop, Atomic City, um, and kind of they taught, helped talk me into doing it because I was really hesitant at first, but. Yeah, um, I remember Nick asking me about like, you know, do it yourself printing because I, I had like all these printers and shit and we were talking about paper and it just like kept going and then eventually it was just like, hey, this is a deadline. Right. And then we just kept, wow, it's like really, it's so vague like how Reptile House actually started yeah. Because of like all the spans of events that happened since. <laughs> Wait, vague is a super good word to describe that <laughs> because I remember at the beginning, like essentially begging other Philly artists to be a part of it, to be part of this thing that I didn't even know what the fuck it was. Just like, just like, um, I guess I kind of want to do this art zine. But I kind of wanted to be like lowbrow. Um, would you please, 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 please be a part of it? And um, we definitely like. I think the right people said yes, so it was cool. It worked out. Was it like at least Tia and Linda were both from Girl Crime? Yeah. And I was like, I knew they would both do it, and we all have like sort of weird styles. Because there's a lot of comic artists in Philadelphia. An insane amount of comic artists here. It's kind of nuts. So what is, uh, or was, uh, Girl Crime? So Girl Crime was this sort of, I, I joke and said I wanted a girl gang just because I just wanted to have like a gang of girls that could beat people up. But instead I went with an art project thing. So we were doing these art shows sort of at Tattoo's Mom. And then we had a, like a pop-up display gallery for about two months because people sponsored us to do it and it was just a bunch of you know you put whatever you want up on the wall and do what you want so it it's funny because that whole idea is kind of in reptile house where there's no particular theme about what you can put in reptile house or not so that's like how i was doing girl crime that's what interested me in reptiles because we weren't you know it wasn't a horror anthology it wasn't this or that uh -huh. but mostly girl crime was just illustration but there are also there was tia there was a uh, jasmated who's also another comic artist that we haven't had in reptile house i'm surprised i asked her and yeah, she's always busy yeah. <laughs> cool. is and, there a uh, a name behind uh, or a, a story behind the name reptile house um i think that we were just getting desperate for like coming up with a name for a zine and at the time one of my friends who lives in new york was applying to work at the Bronx Zoo and so for some reason I had the zoo on my brain <laughs> and I don't know I guess I was probably smoking a lot of weed at the time too and just thought it sounded cool but, um, there is in Baltimore like a historic 
punk house, like show house called Reptile House. And so re- every once in a while, someone from Baltimore will like message me and be like, hey, like, are you, go- are you like <laughs> referencing this house in Baltimore? But um, well, there's also a, there's this old record company called Reptile House because the professor, one of his, um, oh, yes, right. records is, I don't know if it was a noise record or if it was a punk record, but that was like also a punk on it. record in the UK or something. Yeah, I can't remember. I would have to like go back and look it up, but there were definitely like other reptile houses that are usually punk. So I don't know. It was just a good name to use, but we didn't take it from those names. It was more from where Nick just said. <laughs> yeah, well, it lends itself really well to to like mascots. So it, it turned out like it's it's a great accident yeah. in terms of. Well, like, yeah, it's a really like, great like, accident. Yeah, I, now I so love drawing lizards. Like, <laughs> all the time like, never knew that like i would want to do that i think it's great because linda has a uh, a pet bearded dragon oh named so, um her, her, spice her, girls. yeah her pet bearded <laughs> dragon's name is spice girls so i also thought it was funny because she's in it and then her first comics were like the the bearded dragon girls like the valley girls or girls that were shopping at hot topic oh yeah so I, I feel you may have sort of answered this already, but I wanted to, so I, one of the things about Reptile House that's strange to me is that like all the artists seem re- are really different in a lot of ways, and yet there's a cohesiveness to it. Like I kind of feel like, oh yeah, of course, this is, this looks like a Reptile House artist, but uh, I don't know, like in my mind, like what makes that, that what makes the connection, like, you know, like, like you, Tia's art is like completely different from from U two's mm-hmm. art, and U two are completely different from each other. But like having them all together still just seems like, of course, these these three things go together. So, do you have like kind of a sense of what makes a reptile house artist, or is it pretty much just just your friends? Um, I don't know. Like, I think that humor has a lot to do with it. Like, even. Even Tia's stuff, I think a lot of her stuff is pretty serious and dark, but I think there is, like, a pretty, like, dark sense of humor to a lot of it. Um, Humor and, like, fun and maybe not taking ourselves too seriously. I don't know. Uh, What do you think, Adela? You probably have a better, a clearer idea of this than I do because I, like, yeah. have to harass these people all day every day well the first thing is is just like letting people draw what they draw like i said we don't there was never a theme to reptile house and i'm friends with tia and tia and i both like arrow girl comics so you see that a lot in tia stuff more so but she's more like sort of dream like her name's literally dreamy gut so she's a lot more dreamy and ethereal about it where i go like the hardcore fetish route so we're like in the same realm of art but like on two different sides of how we approach it because hers is a lot more cute you know and with each artist like i said you just let people do what they do and some like when we used to meet up i guess our ideas would bounce off but really i just think we all kind of have similar interests and we don't take it's not that we don't take what we do seriously it's just that we're not being bogged down by some obligation of censoring ourselves because even with some lowbrow people, you just, they still, like, censor themselves because they're afraid of uh, somebody's going to come in. Like, you guys can't do that. But I, like, literally just watched the documentary about Spain Rodriguez, and he just, like, did whatever the fuck he wanted. And he was really bizarre and never held back from anything. And I feel like a lot of the artists in Reptile House just do what you do. Because, like I said, there's a lot of anthologies, and there's a lot of talented people. And I'll be blunt, they just kind of fall under into the same uh, vein of things but also a lot of every more or less everyone in reptile house has like interest in something so we're not just drawing comics based on something we've seen because it's in trend we're drawing based on the things that we actually like and enjoy cool yeah that uh that brings to something else i was going to ask about is if, if there's any sort of editorial process for love i guess like vetting what people send in or is it just anything goes like is there some i don't i mean is there some line that you wouldn't 
cross. I mean, I imagine that there's, uh, you probably trust all the, the artists that are coming in, but at the same time, yeah. I mean, I if guess, somebody sent in something that where you were like, oh yeah, this is just racist. Like we can't. Do right. This right. I mean, I guess I mean, that probably it's sort of, I mean, I would say that we know all these people. We know all the artists kind of personally, and I trust all of them. So I guess that it is a level of trust and that isn't really a line that we've had to deal with yet. Um, but I mean, it is, I feel like it is a generally like good rule to be like no assholes like no assholes allowed like i wouldn't i don't know and i i don't know i care about that um just because there are like sometimes like people whose art i like really fucking love and then you're just a terrible person like i wouldn't want your art in the book <laughs> yeah i would prefer to be no assholes because you can use subversive topics in your art and comics that may push boundaries but if you're an asshole it's not going to come across the way it should because yeah. there are plenty of people that have used certain topics to more or less poke fun of society and it's not savory. But if you're an asshole, it's going to come off as being unsavory and no one's going to like you. Yeah, and I think that's a big part of what I like about Reptile House is that it shows that you can have stuff that's like really, for lack of a better word, edgy and like just like offensive and I guess a little brow like your, <laughs> like your tagline says without it having to be like you could have like a social conscience in your work and still like push boundaries and and push buttons and, and do that sort of thing where like in a yeah it's uh, you, you get a lot of people are like oh i'm gonna get canceled if i if i do this but it's like right you, know, you can do you can do stuff you just don't be an asshole I mean, about it yeah I mean, like you can literally do whatever the fuck you want to do but i mean i'm sure if anybody ever caught on to any of the, the imagery I put in, uh, I think it was issue three, because that's when all the protests were happening. The main character I did for Thought Ghetto was a blackface character from this old advertisement company. And then I drew a Karen. I drew George Floyd. I drew the cop that killed him. I drew like a Confederate flag. I like put all this stuff in there. And it's like this this sort of story that no one noticed. <laughs> So I was like, as long as you're... Like, oh, I think people like, notice that story, but I think that you were, like, very intentional about it. And it was very serious, especially for your work. Like, that was... <laughs> it was really, I don't know, it was really poignant. Um, but then, on the other hand, I'm drawing, like, people masturbating with maggots. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. actually... I'm convinced that that's the only shit our readers actually want to see. They just buy... <laughs> They just buy the whole comic just to get your maggot cock comic. And that's a shame. <laughs> no, it's great. <laughs> I buy it just to see like the lizards that listen to corn uh, mm. talk about nonsense. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I definitely need, I want to revisit that at some point. I just I buy it because it's. I would totally buy it if I didn't get it for free. Yeah, I was gonna say you buy it. You don't buy it. <laughs> I was like, I would, I would. Yeah, It'd be the the thing I'd pick up. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, to recap, like it sounds like you know, you're mostly you're vetting people rather than content. It would be like the that's way to true, think about and it. I guess also so. Um, I mean, when we started off, we kind of had a really long list of artists that we wanted to be a part of it. Um, number one on that list was really Rob Woods, mm -hmm. and um, so we try to snag him whenever is possible. And I think he's probably like, I don't, I don't know. I don't, the word edgiest sucks, but um, I mean, he like walks a very fine line. But I think that his stuff Who's is the word subversive because edgy is such a crappy word. word. It's just so funny and so smart, and the most beautiful art in the entire world. Um, Plus so his, was, his whole history is amazing too. Right. So we like we had certain people in mind, um, and so we and we've been lucky enough to have him in a bunch of issues. And then for this um, most recent, the three D issue, um, a few artists who had reached out to me a while ago, um, I sort of thought that their work would be perfect for the three D stuff. 
And that was Otto Splotch. Um, and I knew him through, he ran a zine unit in New Orleans that took reptile house issues. So me and him had been speaking for a while. So he was one of the first people that was like, oh, automatically, I absolutely want him in it. And then the other person was um, Roger Bignon, who is a Philly illustrator and comic artist who's like, work is pretty breathtaking um and so it's really awesome getting to know him and having him do the cover of this one cool yeah i wanted to ask about the the 3d issue and um it sounds like from the the editor's note at the beginning that it was uh pretty challenging to put together yeah it fucking sucked it was awful <laughs> and i didn't help at all <laughs> i had also never used photoshop like prior to this it was like a huge learning curve and I, a ton of wasted hours <laughs> i did i did like a crash course with nick on how you could possibly do the 3d which was probably like real simple before issue seven we did it we tried to do some test stuff because mm -hmm. he he draws his comics extremely fast he's like the fastest of all of us that is not true i just <laughs> he said it's not true I draw mine like a week before the deadline, but uh, yeah, so we like sat down, we were looking at one of my 3D comics, and then he had some old vintage 3D comics, and then we we're like analyzing how, uh, which parts were coming out and going back and like how to actually line the things up, and then somehow, I don't know, Nick comes back and is like, here's an amazing comic. <laughs> well, it was kind of, um, for the most part, I edited everyone's files the one person who edited their own is nicole rodriguez um but for everyone else it was definitely like it, i got better each time i started editing someone else's comic um and i think that adela's was the last i think yours was the last one that i edited mm -hmm. so by the time i got to hers i was like fast as fuck and like sort of understood how the layers worked and understood the sort of, I call it like a stair step process of like going from what you want to be popping out the furthest. And then like, then you go to the next step and cut that layer out. And then the mid layer, cut that out all the way to what you want to be like receding into the background. Um, yeah, at, least we, at least we didn't have to do it the old school way. She right. is studying forever. Which I, now I know how to do it super well, but I never ever want to do it again. And it's the only thing I know how to do on Photoshop. <laughs> That's important. See, now, now you're a professional Photoshopper. Yeah. So how do you go about getting it into people's hands? Like, I don't know if it's available through Diamond or anything, or um, if you even want to do that. Or is it? Is it just been word of mouth or like no yeah I mean when we it's first been... when we first started like we never wanted it to be like an Instagram thing um, we sort of wanted it to just like have in person releases and get it to people that way um, but with the pandemic it like really did sort of become like a Instagram distribution. <laughs> um, it and that's how I, I found out about it. Yeah, because literally the only issue that wasn't drawn or put together during the pandemic was issue one. And then every issue after that more or less was, you know, done through the pandemic. And I was, I was making the joke, like, if you can get to issue six for any comic that you'll just keep it going because in a lot of the mainstream industry comics, if you don't, if you get the issue six or you don't make it to six, your comic's just never going to be published again. <laughs> so, you know, we were getting some distribution in person. And now that things are opening up, it's kind of expanding again, it seems. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. This past, like, I guess, starting over this summer, we had a few in-person things. Um, I don't know. And those... A lot of people would come up and be like, hey, we followed you on Instagram forever, but um, never bought a comic. It's really awesome to see you guys out and about. Um, so I don't know. I feel that's really enjoyable to me. Um, I guess as far as distribution also, like um, Domino has started carrying us in like his uh, 
I guess, wholesale catalog and also just random comic shops will email me and ask for a huge batch and I'll send them out some. So we do have more like comic shop distribution and like some, a few like smaller online distributors. Yeah, it's pretty Which much... is better for me. I would rather them go through Domino than me because it's less work packing shit. Exactly. I mean, it's still pretty DIY because the whole thing is printed like at the studio that Nick's in right now. So it's, I don't know. We could maybe look into bigger distribu distributors. I and don't want to somebody... that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, you if people want it, they'll where? get it. I'm not doing that shit. <laughs> of course not. If people want it, they know where to get it. Yeah. I mean, the amount of issues we sell already is pretty surprising. Can you uh, share a number or is that a trade secret? Um, so I think, so we had, this one was a little bit weird because we had an actual release party at this small comic shop slash gallery called Partners in Sun in Philly, who are super great and support the local like weirdo comic scene a ton. Um, but we had an in-person event for the release and that went insanely well. Like I thought like 10 people were going to show up and I, I don't even know how many people showed up, but we definitely moved at least 40 issues of number eight. And then through online sales through the website, I think we moved about like a hundred. Um, I haven't looked at it since Sunday, so it's probably more than that by now. Um, but now, that. especially with like, I mean, Silver Sprocket asked to take a ton off our hands. Um, and then we send a ton to Desert Island, um, Gutter Pop, Atomic in Baltimore. Um, so probably like around like 200 or 250, maybe 300, like in like the first couple weeks. Do you have any know. West Coast distribution? Do you get it out uh, here? To... Well, I guess Silver Sprocket, they're San Francisco. Okay. I don't have anywhere in, I should probably look for places in like portland and that's Seattle. what i've been trying to do i've been yeah. messaging people yeah uh, like it should be in floating world um right yeah i need to look on their website and see if there's like a consignment form or something but i can do that tonight <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've been trying to get jason on the podcast so i was gonna i would say i would try to uh introduce you except he's not responding to my emails right now so i don't think i can help uh that's like but, one of the uh, main problems with doing comics or communication online is that some people with it are just not really into checking their emails or their dms or they're just like kind of blowing you off and you're just like oh <laughs> well i'm also just really bad at cold calling people like i don't know i don't know what it is yeah. i'm really really terrible like desert island was awesome and easy because you can i can just like take the Chinatown bus there and walk in with a stack and just be like, here, look at this thing we did. Um, but call, like cold calling spots across the country, I just feel weird. Like I'm like, I don't know. Like why should they care about like who we are? I don't, I don't know what it is. I need to be better at it. It's something I'm working on. Yeah. That's why I haven't done it. <laughs> Cause like I'll just take and start, you know, emailing and DM. I was like, I'll let Nick do it. No, see, I'm way better at like in-person interactions than like, writing emails <laughs> i suck at that yeah i'm i'm bad about responding to emails so yeah. i don't i don't i don't hold anything against jason jason if you're listening to this though email me back um <laughs> uh so uh with the, the bloodhorn book was really cool i was you know are you planning on doing more like collections of the of the storylines are we going to see like a a taco meat or a, a maggot cock uh, That'd be sick. Let's do it. Adela, get on it. Over the winter, I'm going to attempt to reboot Taco Meat. The reason why I didn't continue it was because I draw it at like 17 inches. And by the time I shrink it down with the screen tone, it's, it was distorting. So I didn't really like the appearance of it. So I was like, if I do it, I'll do it at a, a larger scale so it doesn't distort so much. Plus, this, I had to rewrite the story because I didn't really have an idea of what the hell it was about. Like, Maggot Cock originally was going to be my 3D story. 
So I had that sitting over on the side and I was going to do that as a, like a weird 3D comic. But then I decided not to do Takomi. And then I switched to Thought Ghetto in like issue three. And then after that, Maggot Cock came about. But we could probably collect Maggot Cock. I mean, there's enough of them. I can do a few more. I think we should. I think it's a good idea. No storyline there. It had a more complex storyline, but then I just wanted to draw that. It's like an invasive invasion thing, and I just never got to that point. I just wanted to draw like my illustrations in a comic panel form. <laughs> yeah, I feel like there was a story, but I wasn't able to necessarily like suss the whole thing out. It was like there's something going on here. And, I was, yeah, and I think it did start out a little bit more narrative, and then eventually it was like, well, I guess the, the invasion is just ongoing. Yeah, I'm not too good at that part of drawing comics. That was my main problem. It's like I was being really indecisive about it. And then depending on what was happening in my life, it did determine how much time I had to sit down and draw it. So some of them look better than others and some of them have more details. And then I would like go into doing comic panels and I would back out and just do, you know, four panel setups because it's faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel like every comic has to have like a really coherent narrative, but anyway, but. Uh... No, I, I I really do enjoy some, like, especially in a, not heavy metal and epic, there are a few people that just don't have storylines. It's just going, or like Mobius, half his comics don't have a, a decent storyline or he's just probably fucking high or something because all those dudes were on drugs. Yeah, well, I mean like Airtight Garage, I think was like just improvised, like it was just. Yeah. yeah, that's that's one of my favorites. You can tell it's improvised because the beginning style is totally different from the end, and it wasn't really going anywhere. I still don't really know what the end of that comic is about. There's like yeah, and he's just like constantly retconning what what happened in like the previous one. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. okay, that didn't really happen, or like that what you saw <laughs> like, is like like completely different. I don't, I, he yeah, was trying was, to remember what he was drawing. <laughs> yeah, probably. There's probably a lot of that. And then, yeah, of course, the underground comic stuff, like, where, you know, a lot of modern, like, art comics, like, you know, there are a lot of stuff that's that's more visual than the narrative. Um, yeah, so are, are there any other projects coming up that you that you two can, can talk about with regards to, to Reptile House that, that people should be looking forward to? Um, I'm pretty burned out right now. But I'll probably be unburned out in like two weeks and then start thinking about new projects. Um, but right now, I just really want to like do some super shitty watercolors. I'm going to be working on toys and I have to catch up on some illustrations. I would like to see, like, I'm going to pull out my old taco meat pages and. The story more or less is going to get, I'll explain it in the one that'll come out, but it's like a dimensional reboot and I'll like get all to that on this one. Cause I never got to the point of why she was a freaking octopus. So I'd like to explain that to people, but more or less, I'm just going to work on toys and I want to do an art book and put more stuff out under Reptile House just to, just because. And I mean, the next issue will probably, I mean, once... Once I'm, chilled out, once I'm chilled out from this release, probably the next one will come out like early March, late March, somewhere around there. Yeah, so you you're you just hit the uh, the two year mark, right? With with issue eight. Yeah, I guess so. Right, because the first, I guess we're just shy. I think that issue one came out December twenty nineteen. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Hold on, let me look at the calendar. So yeah, we're like uh, we're at two years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, congratulations. That's we're in our, we're in our terrible twos. Terrible twos. <laughs> I mean, that's a big deal for a, a you know a small press like indie zine slash comic thing. Like that's that's a, that's perseverance for sure. Especially yeah, for I something mean... that's just comics, you know. I can't think of too many I'm like trying to think what's in my my boxes that made it to a bunch of issues. Besides, like the well, one Scarf man, has just... been, Scarf and us have been like pretty even, I think. Oh, yeah. Because I think their issue eight maybe just came out as well, which was super killer. But I love what they're doing. They're, they're what? Like Seattle and San Francisco mostly? Are, so. Yeah. 
I wish we had access to whatever person does their newsprint. That is so cool. I really yeah, like Smurfs that. format. Yeah. But awesome. yeah, two well, years. Um, Hopefully we keep going. We'll see. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, two more years at least. Um, well, well, is there anything like, else you want? Is there anything else you wanted to, to talk about that I didn't ask about? I don't think so. I'm like in the middle of shipping hell world right now. Yeah, you're... <laughs> that's what I am currently working on. So I was definitely gaming, and then once I'm done, I have to airbrush a border on a commission and then i have this like weird the max thing i've been drawing for the last year that i need to turn in it's like the max and taco meat and i don't do fan art but somebody asked for this and i was like okay i can do that so i need to finish that up tonight cool all right well i'll let y'all get back to it then uh thanks again and uh yeah, keep up the great work all right thanks a lot clint thank, thank you, you.